welcome everyone. I'm uh, Owen Bondurant. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm uh, a partner and um, founder in Independent RX. Uh, we are a company that helps people start and buy pharmacies. We also provide accounting for pharmacies and we help pharmacies sell. Uh, we do do webinars monthly. Um, so this is our monthly and today we're concentrating on starting a pharmacy. And we've got uh, a couple of our clients that we have helped in the past who have started pharmacies here in the last few years. And we're just going to talk through and get their perspective on things, the good, the bad, um, the really good and the ugly. Um, so hopefully you learned something from this. Just a few things. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will be um, emailing it out once we save it and clean it up and get it out. Um, and it'll also be available on our website and LinkedIn. There is a Q&A at the bottom. Um, if you have questions, we will be taking questions throughout the webinar and at the end. Uh, so feel free to drop a question in there if you have them. And uh, let's get over to um, our clients who are both in pharmacies today. And so uh, I appreciate your guys' time, Matt, Lisa. Uh, Lisa, I don't know if maybe you just want to give a quick background on yourself. That'd be great. Sure. sure. My name is Lisa Worth. Um, we opened a Worthy Pharmacy in 2020, and uh, we are located in Olean, New York. Great. Uh, been a pharmacist thanks, for about 20, 23 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, thanks for joining us. This is great. Um, Matt and yourself, why don't you go ahead and do an introduction? My name is Matthew Bullard. Um, my wife and I own Bullard Drug and Wellness in all Louisiana. Uh, I graduated from pharmacy school in 2015, so I've been a pharmacist for about uh, eight years. We opened the pharmacy January 3rd, 2021. Great, great. Now, um, I guess we're going to talk through all kinds of stuff today, from the startup process to marketing to growth challenges to a little bit of everything. But I guess to give people context, I mean, you gave a quick introduction here, but maybe if you could just kind of tell your story of how you ended up owning a pharmacy. I don't know, Lisa, maybe if you want to start and just give a little bit more background, you had uh, a unique situation and everything, so... Sure. So I started pharmacy in um, clinic work, uh, worked at a, the Seneca Nation of Indians, and then I went to chain pharmacy. And then I took a slower pace, I thought slower pace, job working for an independent. About 12, 12 years I worked there and um, loved the kind of care we gave, loved the, the change in how we did things there. Um, and he closed the store, so I had to kind of scramble because I didn't get much notice. Um, and we decided to open our own store in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> so um, a lot of challenges there, but um, I knew I could not go back to the chain. And um, I wanted to take care of the patients. I always took care of the way I like to take care of them. So that's why we started our pharmacy um, back in 2020. Yeah, so you were like a what they they call a backfill, right? Where he sold he sold it to a chain, right? Is in that correct? Yep. Yeah. He sold the records to Rite Aid. Yeah, he sold them to Rite Aid. So, so. Um, they so he closed down completely. People were out of jobs. Customers had to be changed. So you reopened mm -hmm. in the the town is, is what occurred. Yeah. Um, correct. Yeah. Correct. And yeah, and so you, you know, you, you kind of had a relationship with those patients already then and knew a lot of them. Yeah. Yep. Knew the town, right? Because you said you've been there 23 years, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I grew up here, I lived here my whole life. Um, yeah. So, um, I think one of the unique things that you did was, you know, first off, you found a building and worked with the city, right, to get some help from the city. Yep. yep. We, I mean, I reached out to 
Yeah, I reached out to anyone and everyone I knew to see if we can't couldn't get this project going, and and it was unbelievable how many people helped. Yeah, um, and and I don't know if you want to. I mean, the grant, like the city gave you a grant, right? And maybe a couple other people. I mean, you had. I've never yeah. seen anything like it. I mean, you 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 had all kinds of people helping you out. Yeah, I mean, um, I do in the town I know were small business um uh survivals independent business um they were just really my construction my um initial purchasing part of that grant that I didn't have to pay back it was really nice yeah, and I think the point there is that, you know, if you go ask, sometimes people help you. And, you know, there is programs for this stuff in every city and every county. Um, so, you know, it allows you to start up leaner and cheaper. Um, so, yeah, thanks for sharing all of that, uh, Lisa. Matt, do you want to maybe kind of just give your guys' story as well? And, you know, tell us. How did you guys got into it? Because it's a slightly different story. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, first, uh, edit, I said 21. We actually opened on January 3rd of 22. So I started thinking about it. I said I was wrong. But um, history, my wife is also a pharmacist. She runs a day-to-day -day operations pharmacy. Um, we, honestly, that's what kind of, we started farm school together. That was one of our passions together. We moved off to Virginia where she completed a residency and um, it had three focuses, um, uh, teaching, independent ownership, and ambulatory care. So she kind of had that groundwork there. And myself, I have always been an ambulatory care pharmacist, acute care pharmacist, and even today I still work in a hospital. Um, so that's how we, that's kind of our little bit about us. Well, we decided we wanted to open a pharmacy. Time was right. We looked around. We looked at several pharmacies. Deals kind of fell through. So we looked at more where my wife was from. I was, well, it's looked at numbers, said, hey, it could work. So we came back here. We started our pharmacy. And that's, we're chugging now. Zero seven. Yeah, and you guys um, worked uh with family members to get the building right or a friend or something correct uh, family member talk about helping out right um yeah yeah there's a small community the actual town that our pharmacy in is about 14 to 1500 people um has a five lane highway through it and um we had a family member help us um obtain that building yep uh, uh, yeah okay well thanks matt yeah that's great um and so and and we've got some questions coming in so i'm gonna actually ask a few uh and lisa it looks like maybe you're i think people are having a hard time hearing lisa so i think she's maybe uh, i don't know if you want to try to turn your video off maybe lisa and see if that Causes it not to break up. Uh, yeah, it like kind of keeps breaking up and going in and out. I don't know if that. Let's see. Does that help? Yes. That sounds. Is that, that helping? Uh, maybe. Kind of sounds. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, let me ask you another question. Yeah, they. Yeah, there was a couple questions that said. Um, one person asked, did you have the opportunity to buy the files from that owner that sold? Uh, that was the hope, but he got a better offer from Rite Aid. And did and you talk it. to him about it at all? We had, we had been in discussion about buying it. Um, there's a lot of personal stuff with that. There was more debt than we knew about. And we were in the midst of trying to 
pausing on buying it until that debt got cleared up. And in the meantime, he just sold it. Okay. Yeah. And then the other question was, how long did it go from the time you sold it to you opening? What was that about? Seven, eight months, six he, months, maybe? Six months. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, by the time we got fully opened with contracts, it was more like eight months. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, okay. Yeah, there's was, there was just questions coming in. I thought it was relevant, so we just go ahead and ask them. Um, okay. You know, in our prep call, the both of you brought up kind of some points. I'm going to ask this. Um, for those who are looking to start a store, do you guys maybe want to give one or two things that you think that the, everyone should just simply know about starting a pharmacy? I think it's good to hear it just from your guys' perspective. Mm hmm uh, I'll start. Um, I think it's important to know that if something, nothing happens appropriate with time. For example, this is supposed to take three weeks to come back. It's probably going to take four, you know, so forth. You know, everything takes longer. I mean, going through everything, hearing back from people, everything takes longer. So keep that in mind that you might have a timetable, but that's not going to be the real timetable, more than likely. Yeah, it's funny you say that, Matt. I mean, with our clients, our clients are never the ones taking forever. <laughs> They're always waiting on others. And some of those you can control and others you just simply can't. Um, I'll, I'll yeah. And and so, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you got any others, Matt or Lisa? I would say, honestly, um, there's if it's one thing I can tell people, there's so much that you don't know. <laughs> and uh, I was saying to you on the phone the other day that everybody should have to take that boot camp before they decide to to uh, open a pharmacy because there's so much. And one of the best things about having you guys do our process is you have like you got to do X, Y, and Z. And there's like that Monday app that had to you got to do this, and then you got next step. Um, so there's a lot of help that way. There's so much more to pharmacy than just being a pharmacist. Behind the scenes, there's a lot that you don't know. Yeah, so I have, I have a couple questions for both of you. Um, now, could you maybe give an example of things that took longer than you expected? Contracts. Working mm -hmm. on contracts took a very long time. A lot longer than you would think they would take. Um, that took a long time. The actual building construction on our building, the build out, we bought a building and it needed modifications, obviously. Well, most do. And well, they're supposed to be done by a set date. It kept going. It kept going. So it's kind of like, what are you doing? <clears throat> we, our bills are about to come due. What's going on? <laughs> we need to start actually getting in this building and start moving. Um, so yeah, that was some things that took a lot longer than I thought they should. Yeah. And, um, Lisa, you said, you know, there's a lot of things that you just don't know. Could you maybe give an example or two of like things you didn't know, or just kind of were, uh, yeah, along those lines. Sure. sure. Negotiating contracts, how to do contracts, um, all the lingo involved with pricing of pay of medications um marketing uh relationships there's just so much more to it than actually being a pharmacist i thought i was a really good pharmacist and i still think i am but <laughs> the, i think one of the biggest learning curves for me was the time commitment to owning a pharmacy for a long time you're going to give up a lot of free time there's not going to be any free time <laughs> Yeah, and we were we were talking about this earlier, Lisa. When you start a business, or I, I, and not even starting, actually, uh, you know, when you buy a business, the, when you get into business for the first time, it becomes your life, and and there's kind of reasons yep. for that, right, Lisa? Like, uh, and Matt, you, you know, it's funny when our prep call, uh, you know, Lisa was like, "Well, here's here's seven things, you know, you're the pharmacist, you've got to pay bills." From the there's a problem with lighting. this insurance contract there's cheap, you know you got to meet with a doctor insurance. like you kind of have to do everything um until which uh -huh. point you've got processes and profit in place to not 
And you said that. And then Matt was like, well, yeah, like today, like I had my, I forget what it was. Your, your son had to come home and then you had to take him to the pharmacy and work with him. And then you had a doctor meeting or something. I mean, it was like, you know, <laughs> your day was 12 hours long. So, and. Oh yeah. I mean, that's how it always goes. I mean, you never know what's going to arise. Next thing you know, you get bogged down this for three hours and well, heck, you're shut down, but guess what? You still got to complete your daily stuff. So you get all that done. Next thing you know, it's nine o'clock. <laughs> Hopefully if somebody can help you with the kids at home and everything, if you do have kids and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess that is how it is at the beginning. Now, I mean, it does. And, and Matt, I don't think you're quite out of it. And Lisa, you're starting to go over the mountain. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, as you get people and, and you hit a tipping point, because there is a set, you know, when you start these businesses, there's a set of expenses that are fixed. Like you have to pay an employee, you, you have to pay rent like you have set expenses and so you have to get enough business that allows you to hire people, delegate things and be able to step away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that takes longer than people think. Correct. Correct. We're still working on a slim staff. We started out with just myself and a tech and we have since added um, another tech full-time, two part-timers, but one other full-time position and then a, a cashier just 20 hours a week. So we're, we're still really slim. I can't really afford another pharmacist yet, but we're hoping after the first quarter of next year, we can make a decision to do something like that. <laughs> what about you, Matt? What's your staff look like? Uh, my current staff, I have a... Um a part-time cashier slash delivery driver, a part-time technician, a full-time technician, and my wife is a um, staff pharmacist for the time being. That's how we're staffed right now. Currently, we're in discussions right now of bringing on another part-time technician. So that's where we are right now. Yeah, you're starting to hit that point where it's getting difficult to deliver service. Um, yeah, no, that's great. And and Lisa, earlier, well, you've mentioned a couple things about growth and then marketing. I think the two of you both have been great at the marketing piece of it, even though, as you stated earlier, Lisa, I mean, as a pharmacist, I mean, if you wanted to do marketing, you would have gone to business school. <laughs> right. So, you know. But unfortunately, or fortunately, as a as a business owner, you suddenly become the lead marketer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would share I myself. Share myself. I mean, whenever we yeah. started discussing opening a pharmacy, well, I started working on my MBA, and I completed that the um, six months after we opened. So that was very instrumental in helping with the marketing aspect and so forth, because you know. Where's all, I mean, we're pharmacists. We don't really, that's not something we're taught. So got to learn somehow, either school of hard knocks or whatnot, however it works. Yeah, Matt, could you, um, I don't know, give us an example of all the marketing stuff you've done in the last, I don't know, 30 days. 30 days, okay. Just, I mean, now you don't need to get down into the details, but just kind of give us, you know, Yeah. Uh, well, I have a continual ad in the local paper. Um, I was spaced that out um, just for relevance and so forth. So I'm always on mine and so forth. It changes. Um, I um, This month, well, Christmas upcoming, I mean, it's the right thing to do. But at the same time, there is marketing involved, too. We, we have a Santa's mailbox and kids bring their letters for Santa. You know, nowhere else does that. I think it's really cool. And it works. Uh, myself personally, um, certain target populations, I go out and I market myself. I mean, I go and I I walk, I walk neighborhoods and just talk to people. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's all you've done recently. I mean, you guys have done. I mean, it seems like nonstop. You're constantly marketing um, to build that brand and get the word out and. 
Yeah, you do all of that over the last year. And what daily you have people come in and go, I didn't know you were here. Um, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so who are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's um, uh, that's interesting. And Lisa, you, you also, at the beginning, really did something I loved around taking names. But then when we were on the prep call, you, you were mentioned that you had done a local event or something. Could you maybe give some context on those two things? Sure. I'll just give you a kind of background. Or anything what else. We, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you what we did prior to opening. Prior to opening, um, I made a list of every patient that I could think of and got their phone numbers. And we called everybody long before we opened to let them know we were, were going to open, to see if they, to tell them the whole process of transferring it to us would not be hard, that we would take care of it all. So we had probably, I 500 names in our system before we were even up and running so that we could get them into the system. Um, we did, we got, I, I'm going to start my video for a second. Bear with my sound in case it does not work as well, but I just wanted to show you guys something. Um, start video. <clears throat> so in the beginning, we had these made up. These were pamphlets that we could hand out. To I would go visit doctors' offices when they could let me in because again we were in a pandemic, but it would it tells like just our services. It's kind of our look, our logo. We had a pamphlet made up because we do pharmacy automation, so we do um, packaging adherence packaging. So it talked. I put a little study in there and I put this little packet together. It's it's pretty nice because it's um page page page, but it's all set up so you kind of flip through it. And I would get drop that off at doctor's offices. I visited hospice. I visited the VNA um, for the visiting nurses and so that they could get their patients in it. In the beginning, we did do some paper. The paper we don't do that's successful. Um, but we do it occasionally. We had TV advertisements. They actually came to us and asked us to advertise. They didn't have to pay for it. Um, we were part of the Chamber of Commerce. We were recently in the um, Santa Claus Parade. We, we decided to put a float together and get in the Santa Claus Parade, uh, which was the day after Thanksgiving. They have like community events. We're part of that. We we don't do a lot of paid marketing, uh, but we whenever there's a fundraiser, uh, sports sporting events, kids teams, we're, we, we kind of put our name out there that way. Um, just different things like that. Oh, that was awesome, Lisa. Mm. I think that's that's amazing. It is breaking mm. up just a little bit. So I don't, I'm glad you turned your video on because those pamphlets were amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was definitely it's better like, without your video. I don't, I don't know why. I would like uh, to add on that. Uh, uh, like, sure. oh, go ahead, Lisa. I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, I would like to add that, um, you know, you said the parade involvement, so we're community involvement, I mean, people recognize, notice, if you are sincere and you're out involved with the community, people know it, and so forth. Like you said, involved with that Christmas parade, uh, we did trunk or treating, you know, um, we did a trunk or treat, a very large trunk or treat we set up for that. Uh, we're doing Christmas in the park coming up. You know, there's all these different things you do, I mean, I mean, if you're sincere, people know. They can tell. Yeah, and you sponsor some sports teams and stuff too, Matt, right? Don't you guys Correct. do? Correct. We, yeah. we do summer league on sports and so forth, and also the local high schools and middle schools. We support all that. Yeah. So, and, and I, I think the two things that you guys have done well is here's what we see is we see people – do a ton of it at the beginning and then kind of tailor off. Like the two of you are like every week, what am I doing to get new customers? Um, and like you said, I mean, like Lisa said, I mean, some of this stuff isn't like, you're not spending money. You're just showing up mm -hmm. places mm -hmm. um, and building relationships with people um, and, and letting people know that you are involved and that it's local because Today, you know, if there's no independent in your town or your area, they think you're CVS. They don't know the difference. Right. And so, you know, 
uh, it's really important to to be involved and be out there. And every time they go turn around, they're like, oh, well, there they are again. Um, because people won't remember you. And, you know, I, I, you know, you guys are both from these towns and you know people and yet you're having to call them to get them to come to you, right? You're having to chase them down in parking lots to, you know, <laughs> to, to get them to come to your business. So it, it, it's hard. It's much harder than people think it's going to be. Right. I'd like to add on the, um, you said again, the newspaper and so forth. I mean, if you're opening, I mean, just call the newspaper. Hey, we're opening a new business, new pharmacy. Would you like to come interview us? You know, and that's, I mean, you, I mean, that's free advertisement. I'll say they'll write it up because it's interesting. You know, what do you do? You know, how are you different? Those are all important things that for the community. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I totally agree. And, and you guys have both grown your businesses significantly due to that. Now that obviously, you know, the downside to growing like that and doing all that marketing is it does hit your cash, right? So, you know, unfortunately the nature of our business is we buy drugs, we sell them and then three weeks later, four weeks later, we get paid. Problem is, is when you grow, you have to buy drugs to support your growth, but you're waiting on your money. Mm -hmm. So it just eats away your cash, which can, you know, you may have to take a lower salary as a pharmacist or not one at all. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. And I know both of you have done similar things to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. it, you, you know, it, it, you, you kind of eat away at cash and it takes a lot of money to, kind of get going there in order to do that you know i think um and and so it it it's a you know those are the challenges that you go through but you know you guys have really gone after it and you've seen the business build up because of that um so uh i guess what um what would you what what has been a, a, I guess, pleasant surprise about starting the store? What, 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 what shocked you that way? You know, we talked about things taking longer and it being more difficult and doing these different things. I know you mentioned earlier that, you know, people have helped you out in ways you didn't know, but is there other things that have kind of surprised you in a, in a good way? I can tell you that I, I was so, and still to this day, I am so shocked at the loyalty of patients that um, they they so appreciate the kind of care independent pharmacy can give that they are not only willing to go the extra mile, they tell their friends to go the extra mile. I, we're going through a huge issue with uh, Express Scripts contract, and in we had one week to get people to switch to a different plan. And you would not believe how many people came in here saying, what do I got to do? Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. So mm. getting rid of a f insurance they've had for 15 years just to get to a plan that will work at Worthy Pharmacy w was a no brainer for them. They're not mm. switching. They're not leaving. And you would believe the number of people who filed grievances with Express Scripts simply because mm. we're not going to be part of that, that contract. <laughs> Won't do me any good, but it's still really thoughtful. <laughs> So the loyalty yeah, has sure. really surprised me. Yeah. And that's a, you bring up an interesting thing about, you know, as an entrepreneur, you can't always control everything, but it is, you know, you can find ways to solve problems. And so, you know, you asked your customers, Hey, listen, this is my option. And you're solving the problem in a way that maybe you didn't expect, which is awesome. Right. Yeah, Matt, you got any thoughts on Yeah, I mean, some of the gratitude from some of the patients and so forth. I mean, in our town, small town, and all you have here are small, or all you have is here, you have one other independent in the town, another one about seven miles away, then Walmart is about 18 miles away. So there's not a lot of options, and the other options right here are independents that have been here for an extended period of time. So um, some of them, just they switch over they, they come over to us and they're just 
so grateful for some of the stuff we do and so forth and are so thankful for these things that we that we take for granted but it's just pretty amazing it's, like i said the gratitude some people show mm-hmm. and that's been the most rewarding that's been the biggest reward for me thus far mm-hmm. yeah. i agree um, so what uh what would you have done differently Oh, it depends on the day. <laughs> there are some days. There are some days when I say, "What was I thinking?" <laughs> yeah, sure. I this, think last we all do. Week, this last week has has tested me for real. Um, what would I? Do? I don't know that I. The only thing I think I would say, and I said it to you the other day, I would make sure that I knew a lot of the background stuff better before I started because it has been such a learning curve and. Uh, I wish I had known it. And I wish, I wish someone had said, you don't want to open your business until you learn X about contracts and you learn this about reimbursements and you learn this about wholesalers and, and, and you'll be sacrificing a lot of free time, uh, time off in general. So those, there are days when I say, what was I thinking? And then I have weeks like this where I have people come in here crying because they were able to switch their insurance so they could stay here. So, uh, you know, it just depends on the day. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, there are going back to that business stuff and the operational pieces that, you know, maybe you were doing some of it and just didn't know why. Right. Um, you know, or the owner was handling it or you worked at CVS and just didn't have to deal with this stuff. There are resources out there. You know, Lisa mentioned we have a boot camp, but also like Diversify RX does a bunch of stuff on this. Um, NCPA has all kinds of stuff on their website and classes and um, uh, on there. So if you reach out, I I think what Lisa is trying to point out is that there's a lot of stuff that you're probably doing at the pharmacy that you don't understand why, you know, your boss at CVS is telling you X and you're just like, okay, what in the world? Well, there's a whole bunch, there's 10 reasons behind that. And as the owner, you have to understand that. Um. And so, but there are resources to go learn that stuff. And we highly encourage you to get out and just soak in as much of it as possible. Yeah. Um, Matt, I'm asking you the same question. Is there something you do differently or? I mean, some of my marketing strategy I would have done differently, but that's just, you learn as you go. I've done that. I've done that differently. My resource, uh, uh, how I put my resources, this versus that and so forth. Also, I would say one thing I would do differently i would start networking sooner because mm. i have found numerous opportunities owen owen could tell you about that just from talking with people like oh wow that's available in our area okay patients need this you know this is an access program okay great you know there's various things like that just through just networking uh like they mentioned ncpa your um your state independent association whatever that may be whatever state you're in just whoever it may be you know your your state politicians your national politicians you know just various people just network that's why i would have done that sooner yeah agreed i think the earlier you can do it the better um because people do bit you're in the relationship business here they do business with you because they know you mm-hmm. uh, and you know and that and then they discover that you you provide a better service, right? Um, and then that's when they start telling others, and that's when your business starts growing. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I had some other things on the agenda, you guys, but we have like fourteen questions. Okay. Um, and I think a lot of them are very relevant, so I'm gonna maybe pop through a few of these if you guys don't mind. Sure. So the first one, I I guess you guys can provide your input and I can provide some input is how can you stay profitable when independent owners are now going into debt to stay open? Um, I don't know if you guys want to provide your thoughts on just being profitable and some of the things you're looking at, because I think you both are looking at, you know, some changes or, or ways well, to, to drive profitability. One of the things that we are looking into, and we we haven't chased it down like we should, um, 
we do the adherence packaging and there is, and I even have a secondary NPI so that I could utilize that purchasing um, cost of goods cheaper. We're looking into that. New York was harder, so that's why I kind of tabled it. There's a lot of restrictions in New York, so um, I'm still trying to navigate that. But if there's ways that you can get a cost of goods down, that's one of the things we're going to be pursuing in 2024. Um, I would love to say if someone's got some information to give me, I'll take it because reimbursements are terrible and cost of goods are terrible. And so we're it certainly isn't like the 90s. You're not going to get rich doing this, but... I'll be happy as long as I get a paycheck. Um, yeah. My thoughts on it are diversification. You can't put all your money in one basket, like on um, the the insurance um, reinsurance reinsurance reimbursement has decreased. Cost of goods has gone up. It's less margins, but those non like if you're doing consult if you do some sort of consultant work health consultant work for people if you're doing compounding dme diabetic shoes that's something i'm trying to get into just for the issue medicare part b is a headache just give y'all head a heads up there is a headache is a lot of work i'm trying to get into that and do that just so i can be diversified i mean front end sales you know if you have the space is that something you really want to pursue your margins are much better you know, just think about diversification. You know, don't overload yourself, but diversify. Yeah, I think um, you both are bringing up good points. I mean, the I mean, over the last few years and pretty quickly, I mean, the margins changed, the DIR fees went up, the cost of goods have been harder to negotiate, um, but also the market is moving fast to a change. I think we got to start looking at profit per patient and going, what services, what programs, what can we do? You know, we have this base of customers who want to do business with us. What else are they wanting? Are they wanting diabetes education? Are they wanting weight loss? Are they wanting testing? Do they need A1Cs done? Do they need compounds? Lisa's talking about, you know, moving to Billing, doing packaging and, and delivery with Jerry Med and, you know, uh, hybrid models. So we can't, you know, every other business on earth is looking at how can I sell you something else? And for the longest time, independent pharmacies sold you prescriptions. Um, and so we've got to really start looking that the whole idea of a pharmacist being a clinician is actually coming true. Um, and so moving towards that and finding ways to, to better serve more of your customers needs is, is where the profit is. Um, but then also, and, and the two of you have done a good job of this, keeping your expenses in line. So like Lisa was saying, I mean, figuring out how do you buy better, right? Managing your inventory, um, you know, keeping your payroll under check, uh, you know, if your expenses are too high, you'll never get there. Right. Um, and and you've got to be efficient with what you're doing and do more with less. Not to the point of the chains where they're giving you a pharmacist and tech to do 500 scripts, but, you know, you do need to use technology and, and figure out ways to, to do better. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will say the, um, through getting my MBA, the most important, thing that it provide me with to be innovative like you said use technology you know do various things that are different and work i mean don't do something just to be different i mean do something different if it works you know simple as that like i said be innovative yeah i mean as an entrepreneur that your world is changing all the time and i think you guys have both said this twice now i mean the reality is and, and if you've ever watched anything that we've done, I've probably brought this up a hundred times is, you know, you take a company like Apple computers. I mean, listen, when they first started, they sold desktop computers. Today, they're the world's largest company because they sell phones and music. Mm -hmm. So like they changed, right? And so I'm not saying do that big of a drastic change, but you've got to innovate and continuously try to 
move your business a little, the needle of your business a little bit, and then you will stay profitable. Um, another question here is it said, and this is a little bit of a plug for ourselves, but curious at what point did you link up with independent RX consulting? Um, have they been clients since the get go? Did you do location analysis, help them with contracts, LLCs, et cetera? From the beginning, from before, actually, I even was with you all before when I was thinking about buying Vic's pharmacy from him. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. And I use the accounting. Um, so the partnership has been from before conception through up to present. <laughs> well, our relationship started with um, when we were inquiring about um, um, starting this pharmacy and we just reached out to them and they've been instrumental every step of the way. And we also use their accounting service as well. Okay. Um, from, I think the same person they mentioned I, earlier, I said, Lisa, you were getting over the mountain or the break even point. And actually, Matt, you, you guys are too. Um, you know, what is that volume? Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, you know, I said earlier that there was a fixed set of expenses. So like you have rent, you have your pharmacy system, you have utilities, you have some payroll. There are fixed costs that to start one of these and to operate daily. And so you, it, and every business, every one of these pharmacies is a little bit different. So, you know, uh, you know, some stores have more brands than generics or do just strictly retail or don't have compounding or what have you. So you've got to get to the point where you're filling, you know, like just straight up retail, you probably need a hundred, 125 scripts a day. And to really be able to pay your 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 bills and to pay yourself, um, and it, you know, but that's all going to vary. And also, if you keep growing, it eats away at cash. So, you know, to really get comfortable, I mean, and but it, every business is a little bit different. But you know, you probably need to get we're having gross profits of. Thirty or forty thousand dollars a month in order to be able to pay for everything, pay yourself okay, um, and also support your growth. But that's going to vary by business, and actually, that's changed a lot. It used to be like, hey, you get to eighty a day, you break even. Um, but these businesses are all really different. Some are heavy weighted brands, some are heavy weighted generics, some are doing LTC, some are doing compounding, some of. I mean, it's all over the board now. And so, you know, some of that's going to depend on your type of mix of business, some of which is controllable and some of which is not. True story. Our, Man, our, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to mention, you mentioned brands there, multiple heavy brands. I mean, if they're, you're in an area where there is a covered entity, 340B covered entity, no, that can always help yep. alleviate that there too. I mean, you got to look at these different avenues that can help you be profitable because you can't pay your bills. You can't have your patients. True story. Yep. That does help with the brands. Um, I mean, I don't know what point we, we're considered break even, to be honest. I, I just keep looking at, I don't want to take any more from it than I have to until I know that it's sitting pretty. Uh, we're filling... Uh, an average of 190 to 200 a day um, and and you just keep growing though Lisa so you guys yeah. just keep stair stepping upward and so yeah. I think a lot of most of your profit is going to supporting your growth yeah yep and so uh, it's actually been kind of remarkable how you have not stopped growing for three straight years yeah um and so, you know, now your business is more valuable, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because of the volume, but you keep having to support your cash. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that that is a problem with growing and it's a challenge in every industry there is. That's why, for example, in technology and in software, there's so much private equity because they keep growing and they have to keep putting money back in to support their growth. Yeah. Um, and so, 
but that's why it's difficult to say, okay, where is the mountain? But if you would stop growing completely and go even, you would have a lot, you would have more cash flow. Um, but you no, know, you know, on the flip side of that, you keep growing. So yeah. over the long term, that'll be better for you. We uh, can pray for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. It said, uh, would you please provide information on what made you go with one location over another? I'm assuming this is the physical building because you guys both knew what towns you were going to open in. Great. Uh, well, you helped with that from the beginning. I kept sending you pictures of where we were looking and what we were looking at. And uh, I, I think in the beginning, I, I'm not even sure if this was the best location in your mind, but it turned out no. to be really, really good in the fact that it's part of what's considered our um, – can't even think of the name of it, but it's part of the walk of Olean. And so we're at the tail end of it, but it all, the whole road system got redone, of course, right when we were trying to open. But at the same time, um, I think it ended up being a good situation, but it wasn't top choice, but we didn't have a lot of choices. Yeah, you didn't. And I, yeah, at first I didn't love that location, but then the city came in and started yeah. investing in that area, making it easier to get in and out, making you more right. visible. I mean, yeah. they made a bunch of changes and suddenly that building became amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And a little plug for my husband. He did a lot of work here. We, we had to take it down to the studs practically. And so he did a lot of hard work. Got a, a little save a little labor in that. <laughs> yeah, that was a big factor for you because... You know, if you would have had to pay someone to do all that construction, it could have gotten pretty costly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And luckily he was able to do a lot of that work and it came out really cool. Yeah. Um, so, and Matt, you got any, I mean, you guys kind of knew the building, I think. Uh, there was limited options in the town and I um, mean, small town, limited options. I knew the, I knew the highway weren't on. I mean, I weren't on the one labeled Main Street. That's where I wanted it. Um, and there was two different locations. One would have required a new build uh, that wouldn't have been as visible. And this one, the one that we chose, it was, it just needed work. So it had accessibility. That was the big thing for me with accessibility. It's right across from the post office and so forth. Um, like I said, it's a five lane highway right there. So that was the big thing with accessibility. Yeah, no, and I think that's the big thing you both mentioned was accessibility getting in and out. You both have good parking lots too. Um and and it's easy to see your buildings, right? Mm -hmm. Like you kind of can't miss them. Right. So if if a doctor says, Hey, go over to this pharmacy, like they can find you. Yep. Um, and and that is really, really important. And they got to be able to park. And you know, you're dealing with a lot of older people, so they gotta be able to make a left without mm -hmm. it being a pain. Um, and those are all kind of factors that came into looking at that. Um, let's see, we kind of did those. Um, here's a good question. This person's considering buying a building in the middle of a shopping center, but won't be able to have a drive through. What's your guys' experience with with that? I don't have a drive through. We yeah. we we do have curbside pickup, so especially because of the pandemic, um, we got real used to just running things out to people. So for anyone who would have used a drive through, they're fine with our curbside pickup. I found um, our in our area. I mean, I think it's very area specific, but in our area, drive through was very essential. The other independent um, during the pandemic um, in our town had put in our drive through, and that was very vital for us. You know, let's say we also do delivery service as well. Um, like I said, accessibility. You just said accessibility. However, that may be, whether it be. You know, a drive through easy to get off the street, you know, deliver to, me, deliver to people's houses, just accessibility. Yeah, I think it kind of varies on your area and you kind of got to gauge that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, some areas, I mean, for example, like if all the pharmacies in your town have a drive through and you're the only one without it, mm -hmm. you may have to look at that. Um, I do think uh, COVID's helped out a little bit with this because first off, people were more willing to accept delivery. Um, and then two, you know, everything's curbside. I mean, you can get curbside at McDonald's now. I mean, and they have a drive through um, mm -hmm. And so I think people are more um, open to that, but you have to make it easy for them, right? Mm -hmm. And and look at your processes and technology and, and how difficult or easy it is for people to do that. Um, I don't think it's a deal breaker, but um, right. you really got to kind of look at your competition. I'm just going to put in a little plug for old school pharmacy. Not a fan of drive through. I understand why people did it for the longest time. But I will tell you, people don't come here to my pharmacy to see me through a window. Yeah, to get counseling true. through a window. It, it just depends on how you approach your care, I think. So if, if a drive through is unattainable because of the location and you've got uh, the ability to run out to their car, I think they appreciate that even more than sitting in a drive through line for 20 minutes. So if it's undoable, don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. But if it's doable, it's a nice convenience to offer. Yeah. And operationally, they're a huge pain. Mm -hmm. right? There's, I mean, they kind of throw you off. So um, I, I, you know, like in your case, man, I think you needed one. Um, yeah. Like Lisa, I, I, we talked about that, right? Um, you set it up in a way where it wasn't as, I don't think it was as important. Um, okay. So it will depend on where your area is and so forth. Yeah. Um, let's see. I talked about those. Uh, people are asking, do you charge for deliveries or co compliance packaging? Um, you know, I can services? Yeah. Um, we do not charge for compliance packaging. Um, we have about a hundred patients in at this point into our compliance packaging. We offer free delivery once a month for those types of people that are in med synchronization or compliance packaging. So it's a once a month, we'll go for free. I mean, we don't go anywhere. We go within a 10 mile radius, uh, but so we don't charge for those services. If they need delivery beyond that, it's a $3 charge. Um, so we, we tr sometimes I consider, changes in that but it's just really yeah. hard we're trying to gauge a, a squeeze on the economy and so we do the best we can i can't tell you it'll always be that way uh, but for at yeah. this point we do a three dollar delivery fee if it is not someone in med sync or if it is not someone in compliance packaging that's kind of how we've handled it yeah i love that lisa you put boundaries on it yeah right uh and control so uh you know you're you're Given a service if they help you be more efficient, which is is great. Matt, yeah. what do you guys do? We've um recently started um um compliance packaging was a new thing we implemented about five months ago or so. Um after we had our initial patients and we figured out the logistics behind it, we do now certain ch um, ch charges for it. Um delivery, we try to sync everybody up, much like Lisa said, we try to make one run a month to locations but we don't charge for that either unless it's after hours. And then that's a little different story, which we yeah. do. I mean, my wife and I are both pharmacists, so we both are able to come out. If somebody, I mean, if it truly is an emergency, we, we will come out and take care of it. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I think this is, I think what you guys are doing is right. Right. You're putting boundaries and controls around it. You're setting expectations with clients. Um, I, I do think, for anyone that's out there, I think this market's changing. DoorDash and all of this. I mean, people are paying nine dollars to have a burger delivered. Right. Right. So I think that market's changing. And then and I think what both of you are saying is you're paying attention to it, you're debating, maybe you're charging for a piece of it, or you know, I I, I do think we need to keep that and we we need to be okay with adapting to um what's occurring in in the marketplace. It's just like shipping. I mean. But pharmacies also for the longest time never charged to ship things like compounds. Well, I mean, you know, people will pay for shipping. 
you know, unless it's Amazon. So like, it's okay to people understand. Um, so, you know, that that's good. Um, the questions keep coming in, but we are running up on time. So um, Matt, at least anything, words of wisdom to, to leave with people that you'd like to <laughs> leave with them. Take, take your time, be ready yeah. to work hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, learn the background, hire some people or get a community of, of, people, of pharmacists and friends that know the business so you can kind of lean on them that kind of stuff. And like we say, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. <laughs> that is right, Matt. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. Um, for all of you who are on here, we, we are recording this. We will be sending it out. It'll be available on our website. We'll send out an email. It'll be on LinkedIn um, here in the next couple of days. Thank you guys so much for your time. I, again, I really appreciate it. I know your time is valuable and you're trying to run stores and Matt, you're at a hospital right now. So, you know, you're doing all kinds of stuff. So um, thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Yes. Have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.